Today's message is entitled, CCTV Camera, A Holy Awareness of God's Presence. Um, I don't know, have you seen these video cl clippings of thieves and crimes? Normally, in news, they have that clippings. It's parang, um, whatever section that is, when crimes are being shown, caught uh, on camera, stealing, stabbing, killing, a lot of crimes. And nowadays, a lot of thieves are caught because of this camera, because of the CC, CCTV cameras. And the thing is, nowadays it's so common that the thieves know that there's a CCD, CCTV camera that's watching. I don't know if you watch Ocean Eleven or Ocean Eight, right? Um, and and that's, there's a scene there that they wanted to hide from the CCTV, CCTV camera. Because, you know, their crimes will be recorded. Some people, when they see, when they see that camera, they will try to hide from it. So thieves nowadays, they're smart. Before they, before they rob a bank or rob a store, they would make a surveillance. And one of the things that they checked is where are the CCTV cameras located? If there is a CCTV camera. Some houses, they do have CCTV cameras also. And they use that to catch, typically, their nanny abusing the baby if they're not there. A lot of nannies were caught abusing the alaga, um, either spanking them, scolding them. So nowadays, this CCTV cameras is, is a tool that families, corporations, um, if you report a theft in a, in a in a department store, they'll say, okay, we'll review the CCTV camera. So nowadays, this, this CCTV camera has been a tool as evidence. Yes, you deny that, that you did not steal, but look, we have proof. You stole. It's in the CCTV camera. So it's now a tool for, for a, a tool for a, uh, for evidence. But there's another use for CCTV camera. Nowadays, it's also a deterrent. The simple knowledge that there is a camera is a deterrent in crime. Some, some office, when they put CCTV camera, like ours before, we have cameras, they were expensive before, and we have fake cameras. Right? Remember that? We have fake cameras. So that, you know, people would think there's a camera, even though it's fake. Only some is functioning. I remember one day I got uh, a mail from the city government. It's a mail that I was so pleased. Why? I was caught by a CCTV camera beating the red light. And, and, and there was a picture of, of me, and not me, the, at least the car. And I remember showing it to Sati. And Sati said, Dad, Dad, was I inside the car? Said, yes, you were inside. Wow, that's so nice. You got, you got caught on camera. And I was so happy. But it says there, this is, the, this is just a trial run, but the next time you, you uh, violate again, it will be the first penalty. And I was so pleased because it works. Walang lagayan. Right? No, no contact. I just got a letter. And the thing is, the next time I passed that road, that intersection, I was looking for the cameras. 
when did the when did they hide the camera? Then I was remembering the angle. Indeed, I saw that camera. Guess what? Whenever I pass that road, I ensure I follow the rule. I was exceptionally cautious. In fact, that whole Sukkot road, I think, is littered with that. Because one day, I was on the wrong lane. I did not beat the red light. I felt I was just in the wrong lane. And I was afraid. Why? I saw there's a CCTV camera. And I said, Why? will I get another litter? Even though I did not violate any law, I was just concerned that this CCTV camera has caught me doing a violation. Now I realize something. The truth about CCTV cameras has a spiritual comparison, which I think most Christians don't realize. And that is, we Christians, we lack a holy awareness of God's presence in our life. We just don't realize and we don't really think that God is beside us and in us, watching us. We don't believe that there is a CCTV camera entitled God that is spotlighted on you. I mean, it's like going on Facebook Live, right? You're 24-7. Chances are you'll be nice if it's brought, broadcast to all your friends and suitors. Ah, you'll be extra nice if the people that is watching your Facebook Live are the people that you want to impress. Especially if you know that the person watching is your crush. You would act differently. But again, as I said, that truth does not translate in our spiritual life. We act as if God is not watching. We act as if God is not there. We lack a holy awareness of God's presence. If we just have that, believe me, Christians, will be a glowing example of what Christ's likeness is all about. Sadly, Christians are not. And my premise is because they forget. They don't realize that God is beside them. As we continue in our study in the book of Genesis, we're now in Genesis chapter 29. We see Jacob going on a journey. He was forced to leave. Why? Because he stole the blessing and the birthright of Esau. And Esau, finding out, wanted to kill. Wanted to kill Jacob. And as the father, Isaac, was discharging Esau, uh, Jacob, he told Jacob, by the way, Jacob, look for a wife. Look for a wife from the family of your mom, Rebecca. Without anything, without any servants or caravan, he left almost penniless. He was not using that life, in that kind of a lifestyle. As we know, he was born into a rich, extremely rich, filthy rich family. Having a servant at their beck and call. But now, he was all alone. He was fitting for his life. Maybe the next stranger he meets is a, a spy of his brother hunting him down. Every shadow that moves is a concern for him. Then one day he met God. God told him about the promise. And God told him, Jacob, don't worry. I will be with you. I am with you. 
the tragic part was despite that personal first time encounter of Jacob with God, guess what? He tells God, God, by the way, I will not follow you. I will not serve you. I will not worship to you. I will not give tithes to you until you prove to me your God. After a spiritual high, he comes to a despicable low, demanding from God to prove himself as if God is a servant, as if God needs to prove his faithfulness and love. And sometimes we're like that, right? We come from a worship service, glad and pleased, touched by God. But the moment we ride a car, a car cuts, a child cries, a conversation started the wrong way, and hell breaks loose. And here, we see Jacob in such a condition. Demanding from God after an encounter with God. Verse 1 from Genesis chapter 29. We pick up the story. After that encounter, Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the sun of the east. When you read that sentence, for us, all right, nothing fancy there, nothing unusual, but for a Hebrew, during the Near Asian time, when they read that statement, it's a red flag, it's a warning, trouble ahead. We don't pick it up, but the Jews would pick it up. As an example, and I will not tell you what it is. I'll let you pick it up also. Go to Genesis. Go back to Genesis chapter 4. Look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. It says, Then Cain came out from the presence of the Lord, and he settled on the land of Nod, east of Eden. This is after Cain has killed Abel, and he was cast out of Eden, east of Eden. Jump to Genesis chapter 11, verse 2. It came about as they journeyed east, and this is about the Tower of Babel. It came about as they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there, and we know what happened. They built the Tower of Babel. Genesis chapter 13, verse 11. So Lot chose for himself all the valleys of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. The last they separated from each other. Genesis chapter 25. But to the sons of, the, of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living, and sent away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. You got it? Whenever they say they went to the east, it's trouble coming. East, east, east. Something ominous is about to happen. And we know the story. Indeed, something very tragic did happen. Jacob was enslaved for 20 years. So this was a precursor of what would happen. That Jacob will, his, his, his short-term future will be filled with heartaches. In fact, it only ends when Jacob traveled westward again. So here, the author is trying to say, Jacob was journeying and is entering into some trouble. Verse 2. He looked and saw a well in the field. And behold, three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it. For from the well they watered the flocks. 
Now the stone on the mouth of the well was large. Well, as you well know, during that time, was a major item. It was highly prized. It was highly guarded. Oh, it's so obvious because you live in the desert. You cannot and will not survive without a well. Remember, Abraham had to secure a well in the promised land. And that when he secured that well was a great milestone. So having a well was very strategic in a place where water is very scarce. And the right to use a well was jealously guarded by the people. In fact, locations of wells are normally not divulged. It's a hidden secret. You know, I found out from a friend of mine. If you live in a squatter area, typically you don't have a shower. And one of the most guarded secrets of squatter people is where they take a shower. In a restaurant? In a mall? It's a guarded secret. Because if too many people take a shower in that secret place, which is not really a shower place, management will find out and he'll have no place to shower. Right? It's a guarded secret. Same is with well. They would guard it they would not divulge it. In fact, in some cases, they would disguise the location of a well. Now, during that time, it's not, it's kind of, even without disguise, it's kind of difficult to, to look at, to see a well. Because it's just a hole in the ground. There was no wall that you'd see protruding, really. It's just a it's just literally a <coughs> hole in the ground. That's why they had to put a stone because sometimes animal would fall in. Or at night, a human being could fall in the well. That's why there was a large stone placed there. That was one of the purposes of that, of that, of that stone. Also, it was used to guard against contamination and poisoning. Somebody wants to poison one, one, one tribe and knows where their water source is, they would put poison there. And when they start them drinking, oh, that's it. So, so it is kind of confidential where it is and they place a large stone to protect it. And another reason for putting a stone there is because when wind starts to blow, if there's no stone there, Sand will go in. And when that happens, it closes the, the well. Then, then they have no source of water. So this, 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 this stone on top of the well is typically large. One man could not. Some people say as much as seven, if it's a large stone. But typically two or three is what's required to to move that stone. So for Jacob, walking down the desert, the, the, you know, the, the, the well was not noticeable. What was, no, what was noticeable was the fact that there were flocks and shepherds, three flocks and shepherds that were standing that you would notice in a desert, right? And then you say, oh, probably there's a well there. Why were those flocks and shepherds uh, hanging out there? At the bare minimum, there were three shepherds there because there were three flocks. Verse 3. When all the flocks were gathered there, they would then roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in the place of the mouth of the well. Typically, this statement shows there was a water agreement, typically. 
between the herdsman who manage or owns the well on how to use the well. And typically, they would wait for all the herdsmen or the shepherds to arrive before they open the well and get some drink. And, and what would happen is, once everybody's there, call it three or four or five uh, shepherds, they would all pitch in, open it, and get water as fast as they could, and close it immediately, so that the sand doesn't just enter in it. So they tried to make the opening at that well as, as, as short as possible. Secondly, also, they had to wait for everybody for the rationing so that everybody gets the same amount of water because water is scarce during that time. So having all the herdsmen there ensures that everybody gets equal shading of the water. So that's a typical well agreement during that time. Verse 4, seeing that, Jacob approached them and said, My brothers, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. Imagine this. Of all the wells, I mean, this is not the only well, right? Of all the wells in that desert, he stumbles into this particular well. To me, that's God's providence. That particular well. Jacob could have, got, could have gotten it from another well, right? Maybe the day before they were able to go to a well and were able to shore up a lot of water and they, they could bypass this 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 well but no it was this well that they came across and with that Jacob started a casual conversation and tries to find out by the way where are you from I mean of all possible <coughs> shepherds in that area at that time about to get water surprise surprise they're from Haran the very place where he wants to go and I say again that's God's providence with that Jacob had the follow-up question in verse 5, he said, By the way, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, Well, yeah, we know him. I mean, of all, of all the people, right? I remember a friend of mine realized, I go to CCF, he asked, By the way, Bobby, do you know this person? It's called, he attends CCF. So, no, I don't. Huh? But he's from CCF, but, you know, it's like, I, I told him, why, when you attend Mass, do you know everybody in the church? <laughs> you don't. I mean, don't expect me to know everybody in church, right? But, same, right? But them, again, the shepherd who is from Haran happens to know Liban. Coincidence or providence? I believe it's God's providence. But the sad truth here is, despite all of this thing, Jacob does not see the hand of God working, orchestrating the events that was transpiring. Verse 6, And he said to them, Is it well with him? And they said, it is well. And here is Rachel, his daughter, coming with the sheep.
during the time of antiquity, women would only be shepherdess if there was no male in the household. They would get water. That's very common. But as a shepherd, that is not common. It was males. Unless there was no male in the household. Why? Because of fear that the woman would be molested. It's all male. Eh? It's an all male activity. What are you doing here? You're a female. Less the family is looking for a spouse for the girl. O magbalandra ka dyan. Right? Parent yourself. You might find somebody there in the well. And that's the only reason. Alright? And as I said, what's the chances? That the daughter was coming at that time, at that place, while he was there. Not one hour earlier, one not one day earlier, or one week. I mean, when you journey from uh, for five hundred miles for one month, you don't know what time you will arrive that place, right? It's kind of difficult. And 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 when the when, when, when Jacob was asking, so how is Laban? Basically what they said is, well, he, here's your cousin. She's coming. Why, ask, why don't you ask her? Well, not her cousin. Here, the daughter is about to arrive. Ask her. Ask her how is Laban doing. <clears throat> Again, all of this is Providence. I want us to see that when God told Jacob in his, in his dreams that I will be with you, I am with you, and I will be with you wherever you wherever you go, he means it. All of these events that seem so random, which seem so trivial which seems non-consequential, is God working. God was working all the time in all the details. Every moment, an appointment. Every encounter was a leading. And we have to realize that God is always working in and around Jacob. And God is working always in and around us. For Jacob, he does not see the workings of God. He does not have a holy awareness of God's presence. Go to John, please. John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 17 says, But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. God is always working in your life and around your life, even if you don't see it. Even if you don't feel it, even if there's no evidence, God is working. Question is, do you see it? A lot of people think that God, they, they only think that God is working when there are big things happening. Oh, my relative was healed. Oh, God was working there. A prayer request was answered. Yeah, God is working there. A disaster was avoided. Yes, God was working there. There was a great evangelistic event. 
Yes, God is working there. Yes, He's working in those things. But we are not to forget that He's also working in all other things that we might consider frivolous and insignificant. Everything that's happening in your life is God's working. A new acquaintance that you met at work, that's God's working around you and for you. A change in schedule. They might be hearing that, oh, I was late for the plane and the plane crashed. Whatever. God was working. You know, one time, uh, just recently, me and my kids, we saw this man, you know, I'm sure you see this man carrying a, a bin, planning to sell it. Do you see that? And you know, it, it, it was a big discussion between me and my two kids, Bambino was there. How hard life is. But God was working in my family to teach certain values. My driver one day told me, Sir, uh, somebody wants, is interested in buying my, my van. I had no plans of selling it, but he said, uh, somebody's interested in buying it. So, okay, let the person come. If they want to see it, then no, no problem. They can see the car. They said, welcome, they'll come. They never did. But eventually, when I did not expect, they came. Yeah, they came to look at the car. And, um, the thing is, I was telling my wife, the guy, saksa ka ng yabang. Ha! Ah, sobra, sobra. Ang yabang yabo niya. <laughs> but you know what? But God was working. And you know what happened? I end up sharing the gospel to the guy and to his mechanic and to his driver. Lima sila eh. And, and, and the, you know, all those random things happening in our life, it's God's working. Do we see it? And I told that to the guy, it's no accident. Ah. You know, I told him, I really don't care if you buy it or not. I really don't care. What I care about is this. This message that I'm about to tell you. And, 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 and he was appreciative. And you know what? God was working to my son. Apparently, my son was in the house listening. And when I entered, and he said, you know what, Dad? I heard you sharing the gospel. God was working. He was working from my driver to that stranger, to me, to my son. And for my son, I believe, I, I, and I hope, that he's learning that sharing the gospel should be normal, should be natural. You know, those little things. You remember the, the two ladies the one from America here, Ce Cecil, they said they'll be out of town or something, right? But you know, I attended uh, a, uh, a uh, Sam, ah, Steve Lawson. Remember, you were, we were there in UP? She happened to sit beside me. Oh, and we happened to chat. And I just said, I, 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 I'm preaching pounds. And she came. And brought the mother who's not a believer. Oh, then God's working. The, the point being is, God is always working around us. Around Jacob. But Jacob does not see it. He just thinks, it's just, he's just living his life. He's just walking along. And all of these things are random things. Without any relevance. Why? Because his spiritual eyes are closed. And a lot of Christians nowadays, their spiritual eyes are closed. They expect God to be, to, to, to be working on just big things. But not on these small things. Frivolous, non-relevant things. Verse 7. By the way, one of the signs, if a person is a, has a holy awareness of God's presence in their life, 
is their prayerfulness. If a person is has a holy awareness of God's presence, if that is real to him, guess what? He would pray a lot. Every moment, every second, every opportunity, he comes to God and prays. That, you know, is a man that is connected to his God. He continually seeks God's guidance throughout the day. That's what God does in the Bible. We are to pray what? Unceasingly. To a God who is beside us. Verse 7. And he said, Behold, this is Jacob speaking to the shepherds. Behold, it's still high day. Is it not time for the livestock to be gathered? Water the sheep and go pasture them. Basically, what's happening here is Jacob wants to talk to Rachel alone. Note, at this time, Jacob has not revealed to the shepherd anything about himself. His name, his purpose for being there. All he knows is that Laban, the, da the daughter of Laban, the family in which he is instructed to marry, is about to arrive. And what he wants to do is find an excuse for the three shepherds to leave. Para tingnan yung girl eh. Alis na kayo. Eh, you know, and his excuse is, you know what guys, it's kind of early. It's still early, he said. Why don't you water the sheep, give them some drink, and go on your way. Total naman, it's early. You can still grace. That was his excuse to, 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 to uh, let them get away as Rachel come. Sabi nga, gusto niya sa loan si Rachel. Verse 8, But they said, Nah, we cannot. Until all the flocks are gathered. And then we will roll the stone from the mouth of the well. Then we will, then we will water the sheep. I'm sure Jacob was so annoyed with that. What? They want to hear me court this girl? I remember yesterday. I'm looking for a second driver. So if you know any second driver, can they refer? There was a second driver that was applying. And as I was interviewing the second driver, guess who was just there, probably five steps away, texting? My other driver. And I feel he just wants to eavesdrop and hear what, what, what I will say, what will be my offer, and all that stuff. It was so annoying. I, I could say, eh, hey, hey, lumabas ka muna. And, and, and this, and this um, shepherds, they didn't want to leave. Jacob wanted him to go away, but they said, no, 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 no. We're, we're, we're going to stay. We're going to stay here. We'll, we'll just stay. It's okay. It's okay. That will not grace. That's, that's fine. Verse 9. While he, was speak, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with his father's sheep. For she was a sheep, shepherd, shepherd dress. When Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flocks of Laban and his mother's brother. You know, if one would look at this, episode, this incident, one cannot help but see the striking difference between Jacob's quest for a wife and the servant's quest for a wife for Isaac. 
It's as clear as night and day. One was living by faith. The other was living by sight. The difference was so glaring. Remember when Abraham in Genesis chapter 24 wanted to get a spouse for Isaac. Abraham was looking for a wife for his loved son. We know Abraham's loved son was Isaac. But on this case, Isaac was looking for a spouse for his not favored son. Right? His favorite son was Esau. So there, there's a difference. Abraham instructed whom? A servant to look for a spouse. Well, in this case, it was instructed to the son to look for the spouse. When the servant left, guess what? He had 10 camels and a lot of material wealth. When Jacob left, he had nobody and nothing with him. We saw in Genesis chapter 4, that journey of the servant was full of prayers. It was showered with prayers. But in this episode, we see nothing from Jacob seeking God's guidance. The servant asked for a sign, for an oracle to ascertain the chosen bride-to-be. In Jacob's case, he simply used his senses. She simply saw Rebecca, Rachel, to be beautiful. In Genesis chapter 4, when the chosen wife Rebecca arrived, the servant, what was he doing? He was praying. He was talking to God. In this case, when Rachel arrived, Jacob was what? Talking to men. In the case of the servant, when Rebecca arrived, the servant was carefully studying the character of Rebecca. They were observing her, how she served in Genesis chapter uh, 24. How she served them and how she served the camels. But here, Jacob was the one doing the serving. He was trying to impress what would typically take a minimum of two to three people to roll up the stone, guess what? He did it on his own. Nagpapasikat. He was inspired. He was energized to, to move the, the stone to serve racial. Jewish tradition, because of this, Jewish tradition thinks that Jacob was a giant. He's kind of big. Because they're saying, how can he? How can he? How, how is it possible for Jacob to move such a giant stone when three shepherds were there waiting for others to arrive to move the rock? How can he alone move it? And the simple is, the simple answer is, iba na kong in love. <laughs> Normally, when you're in love, you got the power. Right? And upon a certain, uh, uh, upon verifying the servant, praise God for Rebecca. But again, in the life of Jacob, this encounter, there was no mention of praise or worship. And I continue to wonder on the side, what kind talaga of person was Isaac? To have that kind of family wherein brother wanted to kill another brother, wherein Rebecca turned out to be such a wife, wherein Jacob ended up cheating himself, Isaac. Jacob now is a person seen as prayerless in this. As fathers, we have this strong responsibility to be good examples to our kids. Question is what values 
are we impressing on them? Clearly, Isaac was not able to emulate or teach or disciple Jacob to be a prayerful child. Verse 11. After showing that bravado of strength to, to uh, Rachel and serving her and, and the sheep, guess what? Napahalik pa siya kay Rachel. <laughs> then Jacob kissed Rachel and, and lifted his voice and wept. Paiyak iyak pa. I mean, wow. Na in love talaga si Jacob. As they said, chances are it was love at first sight. My wife can relate to that. <laughs> no, I can relate to that. I'll be honest here. I know my wife wasn't love at first sight. That I know. <laughs> but mine, I know. Um, now, kissing during that time was normal between family members, between friends. It was a traditional greeting. But what made it strange for Jacob kissing Rachel was he hasn't introduced himself yet. It's like Rachel arriving, Mwah. who are you? It, it was unusual, to say the least. Second, in the Bible, it is so rare that you see a man kissing. It's normally men kissing. Right? And here, Rachel, uh, mm -hmm. Jacob kissed um, Rachel. Not only that, he cried. Most commentators said he cried because of emotional joy, completing the journey. That he was at the right time, at the right place, with the right girl. The workings of God's hands was very obvious. And he was joyful about that. That his, that his journey is, quote unquote, so far a success. But the sad part here is, guess what? He does not still pray. He, does, he, he still does not praise God. He does not have a holy awareness of God's presence in his life. Verse 12. Jacob told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. So when Laban heard of the news that Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Then he related to Laban all these things. Laban warmly welcomes Jacob. Why? Because he's the son of his sister. That's very understandable. Because since the time Rebecca left, ten, more than 10 years ago, or quite some time, right? There was no news. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, your pamankin arrives, saying, you know, your sister is my mom. So that's why Laban gladly welcomed him into his house. Because a century about, they say, yeah, Rebecca, uh, Jacob was 70 years old. So the bare minimum is about, they say that's about 100 years since the time Rebecca left that place. So, Seeing Jacob was a pleasant surprise for Laban. And I can imagine him also, how's my sister? How many are you in the family? What does she do? Where do you stay? And one thing happened is that in verse 13, Laban, then he related to Laban all these things. After sending down, Jacob started telling the story. Oh, Tito. This is the thing that has happened to me. Right? I was told by my father to look for a wife. 
And that's also very typical. Remember that happened exactly in a similar fashion in Genesis chapter 24. In Genesis chapter 24, verse 33, it says, And the servant was talking, but when the food was set before him to eat, he said, I will not eat until I have told you my business. And he said, Speak on. So he said, I am Abram's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master that, so that he has become rich and he has given him the flocks and herds, silver and gold, servants and maids, camels and donkey. Now Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master and in her old age and he gave him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house, to my relative, and take a wife for my son. He recounted how Rebecca fulfilled the test that was set, be, uh, set in place. He said, you remember during the time that Rebecca um, watered uh, the camels and us too. And this was a sign. <coughs> and in both occasion Laban ran when he found out verse 14 Laban said to him surely you are my bone and my flesh he stayed with him a month now and that ends our passage today now you would notice there was a big difference Despite them asking the same thing, a bride, in the case of the servant, Laban and the family gave Rebecca away the very next day, if you remember. They came today, the very next day, they gave her away, approved, without even meeting the future husband. In fact, all they know about the future husband is that he's very filthy rich. And if you will note in Genesis chapter 24 verse 28, and I will read. Then the girl ran, that is uh, Rebecca, and told her mother's household about these things that somebody is courting her. Now Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban, the same Laban. And Laban ran outside the man of the spring. Note in verse 30. When he saw the ring and the bracelet on his sister's wrist, when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, This is the man whom said to me, he went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camel at the spring. And he said, Come in. Blessed be the Lord, why do you stand outside since I have prepared the house and a place for the camels? Laban was attracted to the wealth. He saw Rebecca, the sister, with fine jewelries already. And Laban, where did that come from? Them. They want to marry me. Huh? He ran there and said, by the way, guys, come in. And, and when, the, when the servant came in, and what, what did he say? My master is extremely rich. He has hundreds and hundreds of herds, hundreds and hundreds of slaves. And Lima said, Sold! Take my sister away. God bless you. <laughs> no, really, that's what happened. But here, note, because Jacob told him everything, Guess what? There was nothing to give. Laban was like, nah, stay here. <laughs> Let's talk. Maybe in that month or what? What do you think? Would, would your dad give us? Because, the, the, you know, the thing, you know why, you know why Jacob served? You know the story, right? Jacob served seven years, right? You know why? Because he has no bride money to pay. That's why he had to serve. Typically, and this is the message for next week. Typically, it would take three years of service 
for the bride. If you don't have money, okay, serve me. Three years. And Jacob was in love. No, she's so beautiful. I give you seven. <laughs> That's what had happened. But here, surely you are my boy, my blows, and he stayed with him a month. Talking to him, trying to check what will happen to your parents. Your grandfather is filthy rich. Your dad is filthy rich. Where's the bride price? And next week we'll see, realizing that he had no money. Okay, serve me. If you want my daughter. What a big difference wealth makes. From, from Rebecca, that layman, come on, go. The very next day, to Jacob, wait a minute. Let's see. I want to know what's going on. By now, Laban would probably know that Jacob had nothing to give. He does not have that financial asset that his relative showed because he, he was the same Laban who gave away the sister and got a ton of money. Now this is your son, give me the ton of money. This episode ends with uncertainty. <clears throat> Jacob has obeyed his parents in, in seeking for a wife under the relative of the mother. The Lord fulfilled his promise of being and guiding and protecting Jacob during this journey. But despite that, there were still no signs of him marrying and his descendants becoming numerous and returning to the land. Jacob will discover many and huge obstacles before he returns to the land. Again, we can bash Jacob. What kind of a person is this? Comparing it to the servant. He didn't even pray before, during, and after. You know, again, he's, he's, he's really a bad son. Cheating on his father. Cheating on his, his, his brother. He's such a bad son. Yet he was the chosen son. But like Jacob, are we not the same? Are we trying to live our life on our own? Because when you are not praying enough, it only means that you don't have a God, a God awareness, a holy God awareness in you. And that you decide to live your life according to que sera, sera. Remember the first sin of Adam and Eve when they ate the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil? You remember what that means? Eating the fruit of the knowledge and eat the knowledge of good and evil is a symbolism of telling God, God, I will determine for myself what is good and right for me. You cannot dictate that on me, God. I will determine that. What is good and evil in my life. Isn't that the same sin that most Christians fall in today? They're trying to live their life apart from the God's guidance and direction. We might not admit it, but when our life is a prayerless desert, that's the evidence that points that you are guilty. Jacob is such a man. And it will take a personal encounter with God to break him before he changes. Our life should be lived with a godly presence. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, 5, 7 for we walk by faith and not by sight. Proverbs 29, 29 verse 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. When there is no holy presence, holy awareness of God's presence, people's life is unrestrained. 
and a life that is apart from an awareness of God's presence will lead a person to a life of sin. I'll ask you a question. If, if no one would know, or if no one will tell, or if no one will, if you will never be get caught, what sins will you commit? If well, no one will know, if no one will tell, if you will never be caught, what sins will you commit? I'm guessing this is what those sexual predators thought in Hollywood, right? Even Bill Cosby, right, is in hot waters. Even that Weinstein, I mean, a lot of parents coming out. This Hollywood maguls thought that the justice system will never look upon them. That they were immune or they will escape the rule of justice. They were living a life as if the law does not exist. A lot of Christians are living a life as if God does not exist. That's why their life is in wanton living. They have no holy presence of God in, in their midst. That's why they act carnally. Will a person steal if the cop was beside him? Unless the cop is a thief. But on a normal society, he's not, right? Will a, st will a student cheat in front of the teacher? Will a drug user ever do a pot session in front of the dirty? Will a Christian continue in Christian sin if he has a holy awareness of God's presence in his life? I submit no. And the problem is we don't. We don't have that holy awareness of God's presence in our life. Which makes us what? More prone in sinning. Think about it. If we have that awareness, will we shout at our kids, shout at our wife, cheat our employees, cheat our government, if we really believe that God is beside us? Will you cheat your, will you, will you treat your spouse shabbily, your kids shabbily, your, will you ch cheat your employer or your employee if God is really beside you? Would you continually lie knowing that God is listening? Would you become like Jacob deceiving your father knowing that God is in their midst? Probably not. A lot of sin in your life will cease if we have a real appreciation of God's presence in our midst. Proverbs 15 verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. Job 34 verse 21 says, for the eyes are upon the ways of a man, and he sees all his steps. We have to realize that there is no escaping the presence of God. All our actions are seen front and center, both good and evil. And the presence of God watching over us is not for him to find fault in us. The knowledge that God is watching over us is not, He's not there. Say, I'm watching over you. If you make a mistake, I'm going to spank you. That's not the desire of God. The desire of God, the knowledge that He is beside watching you, is that He wants to help you. 2 Chronicles 16 9, for our last verse says, for the eyes of the Lord moves to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. The knowledge of God in our midst 
is like a father watching over his son learning how to walk. He's there, concerned, willing to help, ready to help. He's like a father watching his son learn or his child learn a new skill. Our Heavenly Father is there watching over us and waiting for us to call on Him. The holy knowledge of the presence of God is there for us to encourage us to pray to Him more. Because He is there willing to help you. That is the point. The CCTV camera is totally different from God. The CCTV camera was there to catch you have sinned. You have done something wrong. Another point is the CCTV camera is there to discourage you from sinning. But the CCTV camera can never help you from your struggles and your sin. That's the difference with our God. He's there beside us, watching over us, willing and waiting for us to pray and ask Him in times of need. Unfortunately, Jacob has no knowledge and no realization of God's presence. And my desire is for all of us to develop that holy awareness of God's presence in our life. Thus is the Lord. For our last song.